three topics I wanted to cover today. Uh, one, and I'm so, sorry, I'm slightly roaming a little bit more broadly than the, the topic, but I thought I'd just uh, quickly remind people about what the ACCC already does do in, in agriculture. Um, I then explain what our new role in agriculture is going to be, and that absolutely goes to efficiency and supply chains. That's going to be a big part of what we'll be doing. So I'm trying to place that into context. And uh, then I'm going to talk about the regulation of monopoly infrastructure, which I think is also a burning issue in front of us and very important for the agricultural sector. So very quickly on our current roles, because I don't want to bore you to death, you're probably aware of this, but uh, the ACCC already advises on and enforces the water charge rules in the Murray-Darling Basin, so we are really experts in, uh, in water in Murray-Darling Basin. We do uh, uh, a lot of work in relation to bulk wheat ports uh, and whether to, uh, uh, on what basis to allow access to them, because of course they're owned by monopolies who also compete upstream. We do a lot of work in container stevedoring, and that's important because more and more agriculture is getting sent out via containers. We administer the horticulture code, uh, which uh, 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 is obvious, uh, the effect there. And we do a lot of work on collective bargaining um, that involves dairy, poultry, vegetables, seafood. So that brings us into contact with a lot of agricultural sectors. We do a lot of work on mergers. Uh, that's always very controversial, no matter what the sector. Uh, the two most recent controversial ones were the uh, Murray Goulburn proposed acquisition of Warnable Cheese and Butter. We were concerned about the uh, impact on raw milk prices paid to farmers, uh, but the dominant point put to us was don't bother about that. Look at the bigger picture to create an Australian champion, uh, that old champion argument, which I thought we'd killed off years ago. In the end, that went to the Australian Competition Tribunal, and in the end, Warnable Cheese and Butter didn't wait for the competition assessment. They uh, sold to their preferred buyer anyway. JBS Swift selling to uh, selling a uh, buying Primo uh, was the opposite concern. Uh, uh, the concern was that we should block that because Primo is going to getting too big, and that will affect local cattle producers. So the exact opposite issue. Our role, of course, in mergers is to determine whether or not there's a substantial lessening of competition. Uh, and there's always conflicting perspectives on that, um, uh, different, different views brought to bear. Um, I think getting these merger decisions right and communicating them well is fundamental. That depends on a, a very good dialogue between ourselves and the agricultural industry, both we understanding their perspective, they understanding how our law works and what we need to take into account and uh, Mick Keogh and our new agricultural unit will be very helpful in, in doing that. And of course, um, uh, we've got the um, uh, enforcement work we do. I know many in the agricultural sector were disappointed with our, uh, the fact that we didn't find a breach of the Act in relation to the Barnawatha sale yard matter. If you're not familiar with it, uh, I'll, uh, some of you will be, some of you won't be. But we do a lot of enforcement work that affects agriculture at its most basic level, uh, country of origin labelling. And of course, uh, there's changes to the law coming through on that, which will involve us uh, uh, a bit more. So that's what we deal with agriculture already a lot, is the point I was just trying to make there rather briefly. So what's the new agriculture role going to mean? Uh, we got extra money. Uh, in the agricultural competitiveness white paper. Obviously, that also involved mix appointment. Um, we've established the Agricultural Enforcement and Engagement Unit. That's a first for our organisation to have an, a unit like that. And it will um, and has already, it's already up and running. Um, uh, that's helping us increase our knowledge and expertise in agriculture. And certainly Mick and myself will work very closely with that, uh, that unit. Now, there's three roles, in essence, um, we're going to be playing in agriculture uh, with that extra role in agriculture. Uh, firstly, increased engagement, just getting to know each other a lot better. Um, that's uh, going to be with individual farmers, farmer organisation, ag businesses. 
on the one hand, making sure people are aware of um, uh, their rights and obligations uh, under the law, and also making sure there's no misunderstandings uh, about what the law covers, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second. So we'll have an increased presence in regional areas. We'll be conducting workshops, uh, and we'll generally just be out there, and we'll hear and see a lot more, which may indeed bring us more enforcement cases. Now, I should add, at last night's dinner, there were at least five people from the Agricultural Enforcement Unit. Uh, they weren't wearing ACCC uniforms, so I hope you behaved yourselves in your conversation over dinner last night, because they sure as hell were listening. On enforcement work, um, I think we'll be, courtesy of this unit, uh, taking more enforcement action in relation to agriculture on the one hand, but probably on the, long, on the other hand, less than people would like. And I say that because people often misunderstand what our law does cover and doesn't cover. They look at what they perceive to be and probably is unfair treatment. They look at uh, what they perceive to be, and again, probably is anti-competitive behaviour, but it does not necessarily breach the Act. The Act is a very prescriptive document. Um, we have to work according to the law. We have no administrative power. If we think someone's breached the Act, we've got to take them to court, and the onus is on us to prove ourselves, prove our case in court with a judge who's starting from a blank sheet of paper, uh, as you'd expect. We do take action, though. We have, in, on many occasions, where we can fit things within the Act. I think, uh, even though it's not particularly an agricultural issue, our work in relation to coals and their arrangements with their suppliers, where the court agreed that coals had behaved, uh, they'd breached the unconscionable conduct laws, uh, I think is an illustration of that. And when we do take action, it actually has quite a broad effect. Um, I think Coles has changed their behaviour uh, post that action. We now have a code which uh, uh, regulates supermarket supplier relationships, and I think overall things have improved. I'm not saying there are no more problems, but that at all, actually, uh, there, there still are. But uh, uh, I think that court case showed that you can have much wider consequences than one particular enforcement action. But the third area which I wanted to spend a bit more time on, which we'll be doing, is market studies and, and advocacy in agriculture. And this is where the value chain issues are prominent, which gets me back to today's topic. We will be doing a lot of work to understand the issues in the agricultural supply value chains, be it red meat, be it grains, be it horticulture, be it dairy. Uh, we'll be looking in great detail uh, and I believe we'll get great insights out of that that will be of benefit to the ACCC and our work, and also potentially uh, illuminating to observers, potentially of interest to government policymakers. Now, I've discussed these issues with Mick. Uh, he's going to bring fantastic knowledge and really turbocharge those market studies. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to being closely involved in them. And what we'll be doing is saying, what is the value chain to get a particular good from the farm to either the supermarket shelf or uh, the export container terminal or, or bulk terminal? Uh, what are, where is the market power along that value chain? How are people behaving? Uh, and uh, where indeed are the problems? And they may be problems that breach the Act, or they may be things that don't breach the Act, but which we think have a problematic effect, which we think can lead to inefficient behaviour and basically we think should see the light of day. So um, while I don't have much tremendously exciting to say today about those, those market studies, they will look at all the issues. I mean, I'm preempting what my co-panellists are going to say, but we will look at all aspects of the value chain, uh, both from the uh, buyer-seller relationships through to the transport, uh, uh, the lot. Uh, which we know a bit about already. Um, we've got skills in the transport sector. Now in the agricultural sector, as I say, I think they'll be very valuable and a key part of what we'll be doing uh, it, with an increased role in agriculture. The last topic I want to talk about is completely on point. Um, it's access to monopoly infrastructure. 
And the point I want to make here is we have, I think, a very large problem in Australia uh, that affects the agriculture supply chains, affects the mining supply chains, uh, and that is that we are selling off assets, uh, which I am a strong supporter of because I would never let government run any commercial business. Uh, government's hopeless at that. Uh, there may be exceptions, but uh, very few. Uh, so it's much better to privatise. But we should privatise for economic efficiency. We should privatise to get these assets running better and improve the supply chain. What we're increasingly doing is privatising unregulated monopolies and then those un unregulated monopolies behave as everybody in this room would do if you ran an unregulated monopoly. You would subtly put up prices and extract the rent from the value chain. Uh, and if you're not doing that, your board's going to fire you. So there has been a long conceptual argument in Australia. It's been going on for a long time. Ken's uh, been across these arguments as well that says you don't need to regulate a monopoly port because it's just an economic rent transfer. And this has seriously been said, um, uh, I should say including by the Productivity Commission, uh, that it doesn't matter um, uh, if you regulate uh, a monopoly asset because it's really just a transfer from the farmers or the miners to the port uh, and that doesn't matter. Well, I strongly disagree. I've always disagreed with that. I think it matters a lot. I think if you're in that value chain, you're contemplating investments, new farm machinery, new irrigation, uh, or, or whatever else, um, and you think there's a risk that someone at the end of that supply chain is going to jack up the charges on you after you've made the investment, that will make you think twice. That, to me, is a significant efficiency cost uh, to the economy. So I think these issues matter. You might well ask, why is it standard practice then for these assets not to be subject to some form of economic regulation? Part of the answer, I'm afraid, is simple profit maximisation. The governments in selling the asset want to maximise the sale price. And in my view, they ignore the long-term cost to the economy, the long-term imposition on miners, on farmers, of what they're doing. And it's a very short-sighted approach. I think the other half of the issue, though, and this is the issue I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes touching on today, is the test for regulation we have in Australia is part 3A. And I think we're seeing that that's not working very well for pure monopoly assets. The focus on the test to be regulated or not under part... So what happens is governments uh, sell these assets, they don't regulate them, they say, well, if there's a problem, you can always apply under Part 3A to get the asset regulated. Um, but there's many problems with that. The essential problem is that Part 3A was, at its inception, and I was there at the time, brought in for vertically integrated infrastructure. And so the test of whether you regulate the vertically integrated infrastructure is, will the owner, um, as it were, misuse their position to reduce competition in an upstream or downstream business because the owner is in fact vertically integrated. And what we've found is that when it's a straight monopoly asset, there is no vertical integration. It's actually quite hard to show there's a detrimental effect on competition in an upstream or a downstream market. The problem is that's not the problem. I mean, that's not the problem. We're not so much saying there's a problem with competition in an upstream or a downstream market. We're saying the monopoly transfer of rents cause eco causes economic inefficiency. And whereas efficiency and competition usually go hand in hand, they don't go hand in hand when you're dealing with monopoly infrastructure. They separate. There may not be a competition issue, there can sure as hell be an economic efficiency issue. So um, that I think is the issue that is really important. I will just observe that we regulate our monopoly assets in Australia a lot less than what's done in the United States, the land of the free, and I think that's important. Um, I might also add that I don't think people would leave poles and wires regulation to part 3A. No, no, that's regulated. I don't see the difference with other 
monopoly infrastructure, again, where there's no vertical integra integration. If there's no vertical integration with poles and wires, we regulate them because of the efficiency costs of not regulating them and have a monopolist charge more for electricity. The same argument, I think, should apply to ports and rail and other like assets. And as I say, this does affect uh, agriculture. At the ACCC, we've raised this issue with the Port of Melbourne, uh, and uh, I'm delighted that we got a very good outcome there, um, and delighted that we were allowed to play a role there by the Victorian government. Also delighted that the most recent agreement that looks like has been reached is to wind back the compensation regime to 15 years. That's a very good outcome. On the other hand, uh, there were press reports recently in relation to the Port of Fremantle, which also includes the bulk export facilities at Quinana. So this is, this is WA's largest general cargo port, and as I say, also handles um, most of WA's livestock and grain exports. So uh, this port matters a lot to WA farmers. I was certainly very concerned to hear about a possible plan to offer the new owner of the port of Fremantle the right to develop a new port south of Fremantle in the future. So that right of first refusal, you sell the asset and you give them a right of first refusal over the only likely competing asset, of course, is a major problem. We've already got that problem with Sydney Airport. Uh, the, the owner of Sydney Airport's got the right of first refusal to develop Badgerys Creek, which is a golden opportunity for competition lost to the significant detriment of consumers. And uh, uh, I think we've all got to be uh, aware that we don't want that to happen in, uh, in Western Australia. So that's all I have to say this morning. I'm keeping to Ken's uh, very strict uh, deadline. Uh, so look, we'll have a lot more to say on agriculture in the future. We'll have a lot more to say on agricultural supply chains. Uh, I'd be delighted to get asked back next year to talk about all that. Um, uh, but uh, now with Mix on board, we'll, uh, we'll get running hard. Thank you very much for your time this morning.